the first thing I had to do is look at my 112 acres and get more than 40 acres out of them. Okay. It's that's serious. People say, well, well, yeah, you're just moving your schedule out. No, understand this. I'm using only 40 acres of my 112 plot. There's 112 hours. I'm using 40. So I had to increase that. Welcome to The Fi Show, where you get a behind-the-scenes look into financial independence. Here's your host, Cody and Justin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Fi Show. Uh, before I get to rambling, let's check in with the co-host, Cody. What's going on, Justin? So things are getting pretty crazy right now. Just a few days ago, I found out I was in contact with someone who had just tested positive for coronavirus. So now I am in self-quarantine for the next 14 days, luckily not experiencing any symptoms or anything like that. But, you know, fingers crossed. Up until then, I was just enjoying the summer weather. It's been a smooth 80 degrees the past week or so. So really been, you know, hopping in the lake and enjoying getting on the boat and doing all the summer things I like to do. But what's going on in your life, man? Yeah, there's actually been a ton going on. So as some people who listen to the show may know, we've been kind of going around the country in the van. I mean, again, staying away from people as best we can, just going into gas stations, uh, visiting with some family. But Anyways, when we were coming through Austin, Texas, where Leslie's from, we had an opportunity to come up. Things happened very fast, and we were planning on actually moving to Austin, Texas in a few weeks. I'm actually recording right now from the back of the van while <laughs> Leslie drives us home. We'll be home in a few hours. So a lot is happening. You never know when something like comes up, and uh, it's just kind of being prepared for that move when it comes. Before we bring on our guests, let's take a moment for our sponsor. All right, Fi Show listeners slash real estate investors, have you ever given the door code out to one of your properties? Or maybe you left a key under the mat for a delivery person. Did you feel nervous about it? If yes, you have to go check out Igloo Home. That's Igloo, as in what Eskimos live in, then home. If you own a property and are a business owner like me, your biggest limitation is that you can't be in two places at once. And no matter how you choose to let someone in, you always seem to be trading off security for accessibility. Now you don't have to. With Igloo Home's remote access smart lock, you decide who has access and when. Set a one-time pin so people can stop by while you're out. Your Igloo Home app will keep a log of every time a pin is used so you can relax knowing your home or office is still secure. So if you're a property owner who is curious about how this thing works, you should definitely go check out the Igloo Home website. Igloo Home has products to fit every property. There's a smart deadbolt, a key box, a padlock, and more. There's a ton of stuff on there. And as listeners of The Fi Show, you'll get a 15% discount off your smart lock if you order with promo code FISHOW on www.igloohome.co. That's www.igloohome.co with promo code FISHOW. And so on today's episode of the Fi Show, we have John Sephoric from The Wealthy Gardener. And this guy just draws the most beautiful analogy to your financial life in a garden, how you can kind of plant things now, and then you can enjoy the benefits of those things you planted for many years to come. But it all starts with taking those first steps, understanding the right financial moves for your journey, and then acting upon them. He also talks about how powerful your own belief system is. If you never believe it's possible to achieve X, Y, or Z, then John says you probably won't achieve those things because you don't actually believe it in your mind. And there's a ton of other awesome information in this episode, so I don't want to give the whole thing away. Take it away, John. There was a day when I was 30 years old where I took a walk in the middle of summer. 30 years old, I have a family and two kids at this point. And I walk out the door and I don't tell anybody where I'm going. And so I'm walking around my town. It's a small town outside of Pittsburgh, a small town of Mount Pleasant. And I walk up through a cemetery where my family was buried uh, in past generations. And I sat beside a tombstone. And I sat beside that tombstone all day long, or at least half a day. And my mind was just contemplative. You know, it's one of those days where you're just sitting there. You're not getting what you want out of life. You're you're thinking a lot. And you just, honestly, I was probably, if if you try to describe that state, it was a state of despair for me. I had just worked really hard for the last 20 years. I have a family and two kids. I have two. I started out with two hundred thousand dollars in student debt. I'd done everything right. I'd worked fifty hours a week, but that student debt hung over me, and it kind of turned me into a little bit of a wage slave. There's no way of, of getting around that. You know, when you're working for food, shelter, clothing, and paying back a debt, you know, I realize that's progress, paying back a debt. But that's kind of like paying a mortgage on a house, but you don't see the house. 
you know, that's what it feels like. So here I am, 30 years old, all by myself, thinking, man, I am just not where I wanted to be. I, In fact, I'm a loser. That's how I felt. Luckily, I read a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, a man who was dead long before I was ever born. And that book taught this blue-collar kid how to think a little bit bigger. And so at the age of 30, I set a pretty big goal for retirement. Uh, I set a goal for 240000 passive income. That's retirement income. And I wanted that to occur before my 50th birthday. So I set the goal and I went to battle. And so to make a long story short, uh, the next 20 years, I earned that goal. My life filled up with the kind of things that, that brought that to me. I did retire at the age of 49, having met the goal of 240000 passive. About that time, my son's ready to graduate from college. And it was so important for me to prepare him for what's coming so he doesn't have those 20s, those tough 20s I went through. So he just enters life a little with a little more preparation. So I wrote a book called The Wealthy Gardener. Lessons on Prosperity Between Father and Son. And that's probably why we're here. That's my story. That's an awesome story. And before we get too far, though, I just want to ask, what are some of those life moments and life decisions that you made that kind of led you to be at that spot at 30 with $200,000 in debt and that moment of despair? It's a good question because, you know, you say the question is, how do you do everything right and still end up wrong? And that's, that's my story. You know, sometimes you hear these stories where it's a catastrophe or you, you make bad decisions and you got to regroup and retrench it. That's not my story. My story is, is a, a good middle-class upbringing. I went to college most of my life. I was known as Dr. John. I was known as Dr. John because I was a chiropractor. I became a chiropractor because I tagged along with my dad to a chiropractic visit. He got better in one visit. And you would think that's where I find my way to treat humanity, Right. But that's not quite it. I went, to, I went with him at 19. I saw a boat sitting in the backyard on a trailer. And I saw the chiropractor's office. He, I think the guy was working about three days a week. And my eyes are drifting from the part-time hours to the boat, from the boat to the part-time hours, back and forth. And it looked like freedom to me, baby. And I'll tell you what, there weren't too many boats or too many part-time hours in my life because I graduated with $200,000 in student debt. And that's what set it all up right there. So were you a chiropractor straight out of school? I'm not even sure how long the transition period actually is from studying to becoming an actual chiropractor. Yes, sir, man. There's there's a couple ways to do it. You could do it the smart way and go through school and then go with an associate. You actually learn, have experiences in the real world. You get your feet wet. You know, you you master things before you go on your own. Or you can just jump off with a big splash like I did. And come right out of school, hang your shingle $200,000 down, and you have $10,000 of monthly overhead per month, the very first month, but you don't have a patient. That's day one. That Mm. was the 20s. Oh, God, I'm glad they're over. So I'm interested in this goal you set, this $240,000 goal. I mean, because A, it seems like an oddly specific number, and B, it seems like a humongous number that most people in this space at least would think that that is extreme overkill. So where did that number come from? (laughs) <laughs> I might agree with the people in this space that says it's the extreme overkill. I'm not, I'm not defending myself at all, except for the fact that there's, it's just, I think when you down and out, there was just so, still a part of me that wasn't dead yet. I, you know, because I had failed and I wasn't done punching, I was on the ropes. I was doing a rope dope, holding my hands in front of my face and getting clobbered by life, but I wasn't done yet. And I still felt like I needed to I needed to win so big that I wouldn't have to think about money. At least that's the that's the dream. And keep in mind, I'm 30 years old, I'm still broken under that cloud of debt. That's the time for me to think big. It's not the time to figure out how I can do the smallest thing. It's time for me to think how I can imagine my life in the end. What do I want in the end? And what I wanted in the end was freedom. And freedom to me is freedom without worry. I wanted to be able to pay for my kids' college tuition so they wouldn't be in such a bad situation as me, which I did. I wanted to be able to grow my business, whatever business that was going to be in my retirement years. And so if you figure it all out, 240000 it it starts to add up. In my area, I, I wanted to retire and live off of $100,000. So therefore, pre-tax, I would need one fifty. 
you add another 80,000 on top of that or 90,000 to buy a duplex a year or build your business, you're at 240 all of a sudden. So I wouldn't say that that's the time to be realistic for me. I'm not saying that I had, had plotted out A, B, C, and D. That's not true. That was the time for me to sit back and say, screw it. I'm going to think of what I want, not how I can get what I want, and let that catch up to it. And that's that's literally the path that I chose. I just said, what do I want? Started there. And yeah, it was a little bit crazy. I, I, I will not agree with the people that say that. So let's go back to age 30 for a second. So like Justin said, I mean, $240,000 a year in passive income is a massive goal. And I applaud you for setting that insane goal. But could you walk us through maybe the next 5, 10, 15 years? I mean, what were these steps that you were taking to ultimately hit this goal? Things that are coming to mind are like maybe you're the leader of a drug cartel or real estate or (laughs) some ridiculously massive dividend portfolio. Could you walk us through like how you actually got to that 240 k a year benchmark? Yeah, I'm going to keep the uh, drug cartel part off of the <laughs> podcast so that uh, people don't come after me. So I'll tell you about the legitimate things we did, okay? Um, <laughs> Sounds good. So keeping to the story of the metaphor of a wealthy gardener, let's start right there because it is applicable. I used it for a reason. Let's say that a farmer – I'll ask you this. Let's say a farmer has 112 acres, 112 acres to farm, and that farmer's – going to only cultivate about 40 acres. All right. Every year he's just getting by, just getting above, just getting by. And he's frustrated. He's frustrated. What are you guys going to tell that guy to do? He's got 112 acres and he's using 40 of them. Use the rest of them. (laughs) Okay. I'm with you. Right. So it's, it's, it's sounds pretty simple for when we see that, but let's, let's talk about the, the 112 hours that we have every week that are our waking hours, all right? The garden is a metaphor for life. We have waking hours. Let's say we sleep eight hours eight hours a night. The first thing I had to do is look at my 112 acres and get more than 40 acres out of them, okay? it's That's serious. People say, well, I was, yeah, you're just moving your schedule out. No, understand this. I'm using only 40 acres of my 112 plot. There's 112 hours, I'm using 40. So I had to increase that. There's no way around that. So that's number one. There's no getting to to a bigger accomplishment without clearing the schedule and making time for the new things. It's a big number one. Most people don't get that. They don't they don't execute to the point of clearing out their schedule to make time for the real impact that moves you forward. So then the next thing is you have to plant the seeds in the 70 hours. For me, it was 70 hours a week, probably about that. I was working 40 hours at the clinic, 30 hours outside. And what I, what I what I moved into slowly was real estate. I'm sure you know with a with the name of the podcast like you guys, you know, you're talking about financial independence, and there has to be a lot of people thinking about real estate because that's passive income. It's it's right in front of our faces, passive income, and it was certainly right in front of my face. The numbers were good in my area, you know, meaning that you could buy things cheap and rent things high. Those ratios were good that mean a lot for real estate, and so I started easing into real estate in the 30 hours a week after clearing that land open, right? So uh, if you ask what that means in terms of actions, um, that means you educate the crap out of yourself so that you know what you're doing before you do it. You know, you spend time. I mean, I was spending 30 hours a week studying like it was a like it was an actual course in college, but I was bringing the books to me, you know, over and over and over until I felt really confident about it. I mastered all this, the accounting software before I went into it. But then there's only one thing, there's one thing that really counts in real estate, and that's buying at the right price, buying the best ones at the right price, beating everyone to them. And then you start managing people, you start managing teams, and all of a sudden the guy who's struggling by the end of his 30s might be managing four to five teams of people. So don't overlook that. Like whenever I'm saying that 40 hours a week is what I was putting in originally, by the end of my 30s, I was putting in 500 hours a week toward my goals. And what I say by what I mean by that is I'm hiring a lot of people now. They're working for me. They're working toward my goals. So I'm leveraging their time. And there was no question that was a big factor for me where all my peers, they stayed within the walls of their clinic. Some of my best friends are orthodontists. My, I have, a, I have a, a doctor of optometry, a friend of mine. They, they increased their business within the walls. And I went outside of the walls of my clinic into entrepreneurship and it looked really bad to them. They, they couldn't understand what I'm doing. It's kind of dirty. They kind of looked down at me a little, but I was building passive income. And so 
that's how it gradually goes, guys. And you start to get advantages, and you know, the more the more you make, the bigger your advantages become. And then you start, you can't even imagine. You're starting to look at apartment complexes later on. You know, when originally your your knees are shaking looking at a single family. So you build advantages, and big things can come your way later on. That's certainly how it worked out for me. Just solid base hits one after the other. And with those lessons that you're learning in entrepreneurship, you know, outside of the walls, were there some of those things you were able to bring inside of the walls of the clinic that actually helped you grow that business as well? To be honest, no. Uh, no, it's it's really um, inside of a business like I was in, it's really a trade your your hours for dollars. You you're really are, um, I don't want to say limited or confined, but you are defined. Let's put it that way. Because, you know, if it's, the people are great, you're, 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 I, but I couldn't push through more than one patient after every 10 minutes, nor did I want to. You know, I, I just I didn't want to push them through like cows. And so you have a certain fixed income, not set by you, but set by insurance companies. And so it's really limited. Uh, you, you know, I shouldn't say limited. It's defined. I did work bigger and bigger hours in there. And it got me in trouble, to be honest with you. Uh, the insurance companies came looking at me at one point saying, why are you making more than them? And I said, well, because I'm working twice as much as them. And it, in the book, you'll see that became one of probably the biggest uh, financial obstacle of my life, me against the insurance companies. And I finally backed down to them and shrunk my practice and moved into real estate. You know, So it has. It's when you talk about a service profession, I know it looks good from the outside, uh, all the doctors and chiropractors or podiatrists or whatever, but there's pressures of the business that you wouldn't want because the margins are so tight within a practice like that. Uh, they're really tight. It's it's not a good business. It's a good service, not a good business. Something that you talked about in your book, The Wealthy Gardener, and I'd love if you could just in any way, shape or form talk about these is advice like slow down, take it easy, live for today, enjoy more leisure. I know the one that's become popular in the last couple of years is YOLO or you only live once. And it's kind of like this mindset of just live for the moment. Like you don't need to save money for tomorrow or next week or five years from now. Could you talk about that mindset and at what point in people's lives should they be adopting this mindset and then maybe when they should be transgressing past it? <laughs> you, you tried to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking a question, man. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, it's, I don't even know where to start. Uh, but yeah, try to be happy with what you've got and don't push it. I, I say this, I don't I don't tell anybody what they should or shouldn't believe, but I, I do tell you this, you can't have it all. So if you want to live for pleasure, you want to live for today, you want to go paint paint you know your your landscapes on a mountain, just forget about the idea that you're gonna get wealthy. Okay, there's gonna be trade-offs either way. And, you know, I, I do say that it's it's just your job to choose. Nobody has the right to tell you what to do or not to do. You know your own mind, live your own life, but you choose. I assume that we're talking from your audience here. I'm guessing there's not a lot of people here looking to sit on a beach. Why are they looking at a financial independence podcast if they don't have ambition? So I don't have a lot to say to those people. Honestly, they're not my people I don't have, I'm not in the, the business to, to try to motivate you to be ambitious. Uh, you either have it or you don't. And for me, it's a, uh, I'm here for the person who is like me. I was ambitious. I had that in me and I was so frustrated because I didn't know how to, how to get that out of me to make it actually impactful or useful. So to live for the day. Yeah. Live for the day. Hell have a party. I don't care, but don't think it's going to get you to, you can't have wealth and that. So Make your choice. If you want wealth, you're going to have sacrifices, but the sacrifices are a lot less than you think. You just got to get your life turned in the right direction. And it's usually about five years that can get your life turned in that direction. And then you just keep the momentum going. It's, it's simpler than you, than you think. There's a simplicity to getting wealthy once you get the direction going. One thing I've seen you talk about before is having these self-sabotaging beliefs that you had to get over. And I think these are things that a lot of people have to get over when they're looking at this subject, which is kind of like feeling bad about being wealthy or feeling like it it's going to make you a bad person or that if you are getting wealthy, then that means it's at the expense of someone else or just those kind of things. Could you talk a little bit about how you got over them and advice for other people who may have them? Absolutely. I, you know, and I never knew. I, I always thought maybe there was something wrong with me, right? 
Like, I, what's, what's wrong with me that I have to go through and do these affirmations? And what's, what's wrong with me that I have to build up my beliefs that I think I could be wealthy? Why, why do I not believe that when I start? You know, I, But my background is coming up through a Catholic education. Nothing wrong with that, except for with that education. And you start to pick up, you know, the belief systems of your surroundings, of your culture, your family, your school system, your culture, where you're raised from. I'm from the middle class as well. So there's certainly a lot of religious undertones in my life where, you know, if it's not, you know, love of money is the root of all evil or the rich man can't get into heaven and, you know, any more than a camel can fit through the eye of a needle. And then you get out of school and you're dealing with the, everybody in the real world. They're, they're always coming at you saying, well, you know, money won't make you happy. And uh, there's more important things in life than money. So you're hearing all this crap nonstop. And what I've always found is that it's the people who are complacent who are always giving the advice to the ambitious. Rarely do you find an ambitious person walking over to a person smoking cigarettes on their front porch, trying to preach to them about complacency. It's everything else. It's the opposite. Am I right? <laughs> Never. So these people smoking cigarettes in the front porch, now they, they're uncomfortable with you out there working. That's what it's about. Or you can't have a beer with them on the porch. That's even in the family. Uh, you know, it's, so how did I get over that? To answer your question, yes, it was a part of me. And I always thought there was a problem with my psych. I don't know. Uh, but what I had to do, I can tell you, is deliberately choose my own beliefs. I cannot tell you how important I think beliefs are, uh, including your self-image. Like, who do you think you are? There's a snapback phenomenon to life. I don't care if we're talking about weight loss. And if you think you're an athlete of 180 pounds and you go fat, you're going to snap back to that. Conversely, if you're used to being 250 and you go on a diet down to 180 and you don't take care of the self-image, you're snapping back to your fat clothes before long. It's going to happen. You always go back to your what you think you are. Who do you think you are? It's immense, your self-image. So what do I do? All right. So I, I start making up who do I think I am. Wealth is my way to impact the world. I write those kind of things down. Yes, I can get wealthy and s because wealth comes from serving others. Absolutely, I can. Uh, these are the kind of statements I would write and I would read and I would try to feel. You know, they're, they're just words without feeling. So I did all that, that affirmation stuff that uh, people talk about. Absolutely, I did that stuff. I imagined myself uh, with pictures, with what it would be like in the end. I had to hold on to that vision so many times when I was just defeated and ready to, ready to cry, to be honest with you, on, in, on the weak steps along the way. That vision, that intangible stuff, that stuff behind the scenes, it's like the root in the tree. Like we only see the leaves and the branches. That stuff's the root. You know, what do you believe? What are your affirmations? What what do you believe about money? People say, well, I know money's important, but what do you think about wealth when there's someone starving out there over overseas? How about you getting real excessive money? That's the question because that's what wealth is. So I could protect and provide with excess money. I can... I can have, uh, I can provide education for my family, for my elderly parents. I, you have to develop those beliefs. There's another side to money. And man, this world needs good people with money. That's what I believe wholeheartedly. If I've convinced myself of this, okay, maybe, but that's what I choose to believe. I love this rabbit hole we're going down, John, talking about self image and mindset. And a quote that really got me was, you will not get the richest condition you want, but the poorest condition you will accept. I love that, man. I, I think that's such an important mindset quote. Could you talk about what that actually means for someone who can't quite wrap their head around this ideology? You know, Quimby, I like Quimby. He has a, uh, a statement as well along the same, probably the same chapter that man is belief expressed. Belief expressed. What do you believe you are? And then you express it once you believe it hard enough. And thank you for this rabbit hole. You're exhausting me over here. Let's say this. Let's go back to a simpler metaphor. Let's say there's let's say there's me playing basketball in high school. I need to believe that I can score 30 points a game, right? Well, how does a person do that? We, we're so accepting of that in sports. Let's say a person wants to win a gold medal. Do you think a gold medalist is going to not think they're going to win a gold medal when they go to the Olympics? It's their job to think that. You cannot walk onto the playing field without that belief. It's your job to think that. But now when we get into money, we go, ooh, now we're talking about the law of attraction. And we, talk, we got all gooby. No, 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 no. 
No, it's the same thing. Who do you think you are? I'm looking at a quote right across my room here. Man is belief expressed. To me, it's intangible. It's the intangible something that makes all the difference. And so to sum that up, I'll tell you about my last triathlon. I got the worst the worst score of my life. I was like number 14 out of 15 in my age group. And you know what? I walked into there. I trained about a week. And, you know, I got exactly what I deserved, you know? So that's, that's how it works. You, you can't believe yourself to uh, extraordinary levels. You will fall to what you accept. People always fall because they, they, it's a comfort. We're, we always want to be comfortable. So what we accept is where we fall. I can't expound on it anymore. That's In my life, that's how it's worked. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. So what do you do if you're browsing the internet and you don't want marketing companies to see every single move that you're making? Incognito mode, right? Wrong. Even with incognito mode, your internet service provider can legally sell your information to ad companies. That's why if I want actual privacy, I'll go online using ExpressVPN. So ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. ExpressVPN is available on all your devices, so phones, computers, tablets, even on your smart TV, so it's easy to protect all your internet data. Protect your online activity today with a VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash show, and you can get three extra months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash show. expressvpn.com slash show to learn more. So stepping in a little bit more to after you've started some of that entrepreneurial journey in your 30s and you start to find and pick up houses, can you just kind of walk us through how that grew, like what kind of pace, what were some of the first deals you were doing and what that looked like over the years? It started as a single family, a couple single families, because you want to always have an exit strategy. I mean, I don't care. People always think that you do this in real estate and that's that's the way that I did it. And yeah, that, that might be my means, but don't don't think that's everything. There's so much more to it. That's just that's just my mousetrap. How did I do it? I, I went through uh, single families. I went through duplexes. I went up to uh, four plexes. I just went very cautiously up the ladder, you know. And to be honest with you, it was pretty boring. It was it was just me leaving the house, me coming back at nighttime. Uh, I was I was winning base hits. Uh, my kids heard it over and over: base hits wins games, base hits wins games. And then, you know, you, what you'll see is when you, you you'll get a few breaks along the way that are big ones. You know, people say, "Oh, you're lucky." Well, you're lucky in the way that, you know, you caught a fish because your line's in the water and the fish is there. You're lucky that way, but you're not too lucky compared to you who isn't fishing, you know? So like, yeah, you're, no, no, no. My mind's just on this. That's the game you're in. And when your mind is on something like that and the game you're in, you'll see the opportunities. They'll roll around things that you can't even imagine. So yeah, did I have a group of six duplexes once come to me and... You know, you talk about how does it happen? It happens in unbelievable ways. Sometimes like this group of duplexes, eight duplexes, for example, came to me, uh, didn't come to me at all. They went up for sale. Everybody's trying to pick them off one by one. I offered to buy them all, all of them at half price. Well, that seems extraordinary because the only, they're a really nice group of duplexes sitting in the, the nicest part of our town. But I said, I would take them all without inspections and get them all off your hands right now. The advantage of that is it's an estate. So there's reasons why I the, the estate bunches want their money right now versus people picking these things off one or the other. But because I'm looking for it, I see it. And so I walk up to this thing and I make this offer. Well, they said yes. And nobody can believe it, including the, the realtors. And those kind of things happen to you. Now, keep in mind, those things happen to you along the way when you talk. I didn't have any contractors. I fired everybody before this. I didn't have any money because it was all wrapped up in my foreclosures. I was betting money I didn't have on the down payments. And so it was a big risk, but these kind of risks come along. And if you find the right deals, the uh, you can find the money. You can always find the money for the right deals because it's protected. It's 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 a good deal. So to answer your question, it's always about those things. You can't plot it from A to B to C to D. You'll you'll just you just keep doing things right and gaining an advantage, getting an advantage, gaining an advantage. And that advantage for me was a growing snowball of money. That was the power, man. You know. I always, in my 40s, that's when you felt powerful. And 
there was that Disney show, you know, the, uh, the Aladdin show where uh, the genie's singing, you know, Aladdin he comes out of the bottle and he's saying, you ain't never got a friend like me. <laughs> that thing, that was money in my 40s. I never had a friend like that because I came from not having money. Keep in mind, guys, I came from my parents started a half trailer, not a trailer, a half trailer. So by my 40s, I have this friend. I'm walking arm in arm. And that's my genie. And he's buying me. He's giving me the power to buy apartment complexes now. And life is a whole lot different if you respect that partner. And that's how it works. You can't see it. I can tell you that. You got to believe it. Just, just believe if you do the things right long enough, uh, you'll have opportunities come your way. That's what I found. And I wish I didn't worry so much along the way because, damn it, they came along the way anyway. I look back. I always knew it would work, but then I always worried about it. So that's the lesson, I think. So speaking of not seeing, John, what is the unseen force and how has it affected you and your businesses? Uh, you're, you're getting me now. You're always picking on me. <laughs> uh, I did my research. Yes, you did. So the unseen force, to me, I have no problem saying that this... This was a book for my son, okay? So the unseen force to me is a spirituality. I I choose to look at, at this world. Uh, this is a good this is a good framework to see it. You know how the Matrix has this this world that's governed by machines and is controlled by machines, right? I choose to see this world as a universe that is controlled by some kind of force that I don't quite understand. I can tell you that I'm as agnostic as they come. I know what I don't know, and I don't know a lot. But I cannot fathom why things are so arranged in such precision. And a little bit of uh, imbalance causes so much death. And so there's there's just such intr- uh, intrinsic uh, calculation to life. And so I, I just cannot grasp how that's not designed. So if you believe in a design then you believe in a designer, okay? I believe in a power of faith. There is something about applied faith that I cannot explain, but I can tell you the the coincidences in my life have happened at such a consistent rate that if I put my faith on an outcome and I can generate this idea day after day after day, meaning my outcome, I get breaks and I get breaks and I get breaks. And I do believe that for me, everybody's entitled. I'm not asking anybody to believe what I believe. I believe that there is a, a world out there that somehow gets attuned to a clarity of mind backed by a powerful faith. And most people don't experience that because they don't stick with it long enough. The challenge of it is, is that sticking with faith when you see everything around you not looking like the thing you're trying to focus on. That's the challenge of this game. You're down 27 in the fourth quarter, but you got to believe you're going to win that game. Who can do that? That's the question. And if you can put your mind on that, I think I had such desperation in my life financially at one point that I had extreme motivation to be very focused and what I call faith-filled. You know, so it's a it's a focused faith. That's my term. Focused faith. I believe there's power to it. So you've mentioned a couple times, you know, some point of disparity or kind of downtimes and, you know, in, envisioning this life and hitting this $240,000 goal. But then at some point you hit it, you get there. Then what? Like, what is it that you were using to motivate yourself? Did you keep trying to go past the 240? Like, what does that look like after you actually get there? You know what it looks like is it looks like you ran through a a ticker, of, ran through the final of of a the final steps of a marathon is what it it's, it's almost like when you get there and you pass through that time and you sit down and you, it's like, I think I just did this. And, and you look backwards and you say, okay, and you start doing your numbers and you start calculating it. And it's almost like, okay, I'm, I'm here now and I've got it. I, the day it happened for me, I know I was coming after a, uh, you talk about the unseen force, my, my odd beliefs or, or you better have odd beliefs. You better have an unusual way of doing things if you want to have an unusual outcome. So, yeah, uh, I'm one of those guys that made a check, okay? I put that check on the wall, that imaginary check, and I looked at it. I saw it day after day. So when I got there, there was an odd sense of familiarity. But the day I discovered that I got there was a little bizarre because I did come from my accountant. 
I used to love meeting with the accountant because he was the only one that could see what I was doing. Because if you're doing it right, the world really can't see it. You're not spending your money. You're saving. You're making a big snowball. And so I came back from there. I'm exhausted. He always worked, He always wipes me out, my accountant. And I'm sitting back in this chair. I'm looking at this wall. And my eyes drift to this, what we call a vision board. And it's like, son of a gun. And so I have this number sitting over here on the check. It's not like you sit there and you just obsess over it every day. You kind of see it every day, you know, but you spend time thinking about your goals. But I sat down after that, that, uh, with the accountant and I missed it. I was short. I mean, but I was within like $200, like astronomically impossible coincidence numbers, you know, to get up there. And I, the, the number of things that happened in the last couple of years that tumbled forward to make that forward to make that happen were scary. It just coincidences that came at me that, uh, I could not have done on my own. I needed some lucky breaks. So when you talk about the unforeseen force, I do believe that if I put my head on something long enough and I work my hands long enough, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in faith only. I'm a believer in work with faith. Okay, you got to work yourself too. Uh, yeah, you can get some lucky breaks in this life, and I needed every one of them. So continuing with your story a little bit, when did the actual idea to write the Wealthy Gardener come into your head? I would say that that came within months after, after, because you get through, you know, I'm, I'm just convinced that uh, you'll find that human beings, you need, we're, we're set up with this design where we have to feel useful. We have to have a, a sense of fulfillment. And for whatever reason, we gain that from uh, service to others or service to a cause. It's just an irritating thing about human beings. It would be really nice if we could just sit on a beach and be happy, but that doesn't last too long, you know? And I, I heard it explained once where uh, Maslow actually said we have an instinct for the tribe, to give back to the tribe. It's one of our instinctual things, We and we haven't shed that instinct yet. And it explains a lot, because if you take away all the all the mandatory hours of your job, everything that you have to do every day, and then you gain freedom, you'll find that there's something missing. And it's not that money makes you unhappy. That's bull. Don't think that. Life is a lot better without money worries. And you know the people that are saying it's not, well, they got their own problems and money's not the cause of it. So my life is far better with money. But there was something missing. And I felt uh, a sense of desolation, a sense of, uh, I guess you'd call it, um, I don't know, kind of like a friendly sadness. I always call it that. I, I found that sadness and those kind of emotions aren't something to run from, but they're something that can steer you. I always sit down and I feel like, okay, what's what's out of line in my life if I feel this way? This isn't normal. Not for me, it's not. And so I will sit down and I'll, I'll, I'll spend time meditating or, or just sitting in that feeling and trying to figure out what does this mean now? And so when I was thinking about writing the book, The Wealthy Gardener, for my son, I felt like that could kind of lifted. It was like a new purpose that kind of gave me a, a sense of direction. And I believe in direction. So I went and talked to him about it. I said, I'm thinking about writing a book, Mike, and I, I would like to uh, you know, document some of the lessons. I mean, you're in college now. I, I like to, I'd like you to be my editor. So I lied to him completely. <laughs> I, I wanted him to well, you you go try to tell a 19-year-old he's gonna read your book over, you know, of life lessons when you're a dad. And good luck on that. So I I I said, Mike, I need an editor. How about it? Can you take a look at this uh, first chapter and tell me if I'm wasting my time? And we just eased into it, you know, bit by bit. And I, what I asked him to do was argue with me. And that really created a great learning tool from father to son, just a spiritual, fantastic time that really bonded us over three years. And it was just me and him uh, going back and forth, debating, fighting, talking about lessons, talking about life, ideas. So you write this book for your son, and I'm sure, as with everything else, you had some visions of what you hoped that it would do for him, like the impacts it would have on him. Since the book has been out, have you started to see that as he went through the editing process or it coming out, or how do you hope that it impacts him? Sure, man. I, I said, Mike, I got you over a rock, pal. I said, if you screw up in life, I'm going to tell everybody you just didn't apply the life lessons and you didn't learn it. And if you do well, I'm going to take all the credit. So... I, I got this all figured out, guys. Uh, no, but to be honest with you, uh, he's a 25-year-old uh, guy right now. I, I can't take a whole lot of credit. I mean, the, even though he's he's doing fantastic. He's, uh, he's He thinks like a 40-year-old. He saves over half of his money. He's in banking. He's, he's better off at 25 than I was at 37. Uh, but am I going to take credit to all that? 
you know what I, th- I think as a parent, your job is just to get out of this parenting th- uh, thing, doing your best, but don't think that their future problems and their future decisions, good and bad, are are really from you. Uh, they're they're on their own once they leave the house. And I did my best, and I that that was my goal. If he screws up at this point, it's on him. Uh, as a parent, that was a valuable time. I kind of miss it, but uh, he's doing fantastic uh, now. And then I self-published the book and. It took off in its own direction, so maybe there's more Michaels out there for me to to talk to as well. So that's that's where we are right now. But he's doing great to answer your question. Definitely, man. I love how it's kind of like a discussion. The book is a relationship between a father and son. And I know this was written specifically for your son Michael, but obviously not every parent out there listening to this who are in contact with the Fi Show or want to hear about John's story, they can't all write a book for their son or daughter. Could you talk about some lessons or some things that? you could teach a son or daughter, no matter, regardless of age, that could set them up for this type of success down the road? You know, I think there's there's the obvious stuff that I don't want to get into is going to bore your, bore your guests because we all know we need clarity, we need goals, we need persistence, we need, you know, we all know that, okay? I think some of the things, and that's all in the, this, that's all in the book, of course, you know, you, you can't write a book without that. But I think to answer your question, what's most interesting is some of the things that I learned along the way that are surprising to me. Like when I'm 20 years old, I was kind of thinking that I'm not sure if I want wealth because it looks so complicated. The lifestyle is so complex and pressure packed on TV. You see people with red faces bursting and, you know, I wasn't sure that's that's what I wanted. And what I found, uh, to be honest with you, for me, it was that it's a simplicity that I had to acquire in order to become wealthy. I had to push a lot of things out of the way and get real, real directed. And that was a surprise. You know, I had what they call prune the non-fruiting branches of the tree. You know, get rid of the things that don't work, clear that land, the 112 acres, put more hours in there. It's a simpler life. I I find it more, more satisfying. Another thing I think, you know, in terms of the beliefs that you were talking about before, I think one of the things that were, uh, I was brainwashed into believing is that People who strive for wealth are certainly going to be a little more materialistic, a little more shallow than the rest of us. And I found that to be just the opposite for me. Like we can just speak from our own our own perspectives. For me, I had to have less materialism than all of my friends. I drove cars that were below me. I lived in houses far less than I could afford. Uh, and so for me, I needed a detachment from materialism. Not that I was like, super psyched up and I wasn't buying things. I was delaying my gratifications, like things like that. Now you get into spirituality and the unseen force. Not many people bring that up, but th- that's that's a big part of the book. I fought for that uh, with Penguin when they bought the book. They wanted to bring it to you know they're they're New Yorkers up there and they wanted to move all the capital letters down and down to small. And I'm like, no. No, I'll take the book back. You can't have the book. I don't care how much you're, you know, they're giving me a six figure advance. I don't care. I don't need your money. Capital letters stay. And so, yes, yeah, spirituality, I do believe that my quest for wealth was a spiritual adventure. Lesson number one in the book. Uh, no question. Things like that. You know, we always talk about courage. We got to gain courage. Well, sometimes courage is like driving a car off a cliff, guys. You need courage, but you need caution. You need a pedal to push down, but you need a brake too. And so the judgment between those kind of things, those are the kind of things I learned. But maybe most important of all is it's about contribution and service to others. When you you just can't get there. We we live in this this free enterprise system with barring a few terrible uh, ways to make money. It's all set up that the most selfish thing you can do is to serve others and to serve them massively and to serve them better than everybody else. The system is set that you're going to only become wealthy if you can attract that kind of money. And so you have to, it really brings out the best in you, the commitment, the, the, the contribution of service. I think it's one of the best things about our free market society. I can hear just like a ton of passion in your voice as you talk about all of these things. And so now that you have met a lot of them, you've written this book, you've met these big financial goals If you're trying to build like a 2030 vision board, what does that look like? Like, How are you going to kind of keep feeding that appetite, this passion that you have? That's a hell of a question. And it'll, I'll tell you that's, that's it. And and this is real life stuff now because, okay, you, you get to the book, you write that done. Now what? 
Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's a now what now? Uh, yeah, I have to self-publish this. Okay. It went on and it, it started becoming successful. I, it was translated into three languages and it was it took off as a self-published book, you know, all on, on its own. It hit number 46 on Audible. I didn't I didn't see all that coming. So now what? Uh, I'm I'm super uh, you know grateful to have you guys uh, to be talking to this kind of stuff right here. So now what? I think about that a lot, but that's the thing I have to figure out. Uh, we don't always have it all figured out. Sometimes it's it's a little bit cloudy, and you're kind of living in a little bit of a fog, and you're trying to fill your way, and maybe some sort of uh, feeling comes along and it starts pushing you into another another direction. I. You know the Buddhists will tell you that that life is suffering, right? It's they they will that's the precept of their their beliefs number one, and they'll tell you as well that spirituality is always based on the alleviation of suffering, and I think the wealthy gardener can alleviate suffering. I think that that book is a philosophy that can help people who read it. They can experience how to do this. They can experience a financial, uh, you know, a philosophy of financial achievement. And maybe that alleviates financial suffering. And so that just might be my unfinished business is, is trying to get that book out to help other people who were suffering like I was. I don't know, but that's probably where I'm looking right now. All right. Well, John, this podcast has just been a wealth of information. Appreciate you coming on, talking about your story, talking about the book some. For anyone who wants to, A, read more about you see where they can buy The Wealthy Gardener, or just learn more about your story and these concepts, where are some of the best places they can do that? You know, my my website's wealthygardener.com, but I, I like to dumb it down for people like me. Uh, so I assume that uh, you'll have some show notes under here and you'll just send them over here. What we try to do is make a dedicated page for the topics specific to what we just talked about. And so if it is, if anybody wants to learn more, it's just an educational website. You'll see that there's nothing for sale. There's no upsells, no courses, things like that. At this point, we're just trying to help. So go down to your notes. You'll link them over to me, I say. Thanks again for coming on the show. One thing we always like to ask our guests is what is that one tangible tip for somebody who is chasing financial independence that you'd like to give them? Guys, I, I can't tell you enough. At, this, at the point of being repetitious here, the importance of thinking of of a farm that has 112 acres, you know, and you're only using 40 of them. You, if you really want financial independence, you just have to expand the area that you're planting crops in. And then you just have to plant in more hours and you got to make sure that they're quality. You got to put impact in your week, far more impact in your week than the average person. If you look at the average, average is dangerous in our society. So you have to plant more, not for the rest of your life, but just for a time. And like, if you look at me now, yes, I did plant more in my time for a while, but I might work 20 hours a week now. And by work, I call this work. Like, so we're talking in the middle class, we call this talking, we don't call this work. So. It gets easier. You can start to do more of what you like, less of what you dread, but you cannot do that unless you sacrifice something now. If you don't sacrifice it now, you'll sacrifice the rest of your life. So you take your pick. That's what it comes down to. Awesome advice, man. And so you're almost out of here, but we do got one last question and I didn't prepare for this. Justin didn't prepare. So John, you're definitely not prepared because this is the wild card question. Are you ready? <laughs> no, no, I'm not ready for you. You've been throwing wild cards at me all day. <laughs> That's what I do best, John. So <laughs> the book is called The Wealthy Gardener and I love all of the gardening and farming analogies you've been using throughout this podcast. I think they're really powerful ways to kind of translate money to things that people can actually think about because money just seems like such a crazy intangible concept to so many people do you have a garden and what are some of your favorite vegetables <laughs> i knew you're gonna ask this did you <laughs> um i could smell it i could i could i could see i could see you going down this route asking me if i have a garden yeah i can feel it all right uh yeah that's my intuition uh so do i have a garden i no, i've not planted a garden my entire life Man. it's a metaphor <laughs> It's a metaphor. My, I, I built the garden, the walls, and everything where my wife does it. And my, my mother is a, uh, she's what do you, yeah, she's she's big time. But 
No, to me, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that I stole off of Earl Nightingale at first. I mean, it's just, I love the idea of sowing and reaping the garden, you know, being a metaphor for time. That's how I used it. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on the story. You just have a really unique way of looking at things. And it's a really cool story of just putting your mind to something like putting something out there and going after it full throttle. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing this story with us. It's my honor to be here, guys. And, uh, you know, I support what you're doing. And let me say that uh, I'm, I'll follow you guys forever. You're, you're fantastic. And I, I love the enthusiasm, the hard questions. I'm not sure if you meant that right by a, I have an unusual way to look at things, but I'll take it as a compliment. And uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Another great episode, Cody, where we have a gardener who's not actually a gardener. What do you think about the episode? <laughs> Yeah, this was another awesome episode, Justin. And what was crazy to me going along with the analogy of the garden, like John didn't realize his journey or his path or he didn't have that moment in clarity until he was sitting in that graveyard at age 30. So despite what you think, you don't always have to plant the garden in your teens, in your 20s. You can start this garden later in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. And those seeds will still grow and those seeds will still have fruitful plants for you know decades and years to come. So I thought that was just a really interesting point and something that we hear a lot is like, is it too late for me to start my financial independence journey? I don't think that is, that's not right at all. John proved that to us. He ended up hitting financial independence 19 years after he did have that realization, although he did have a very high income. And we'll talk a bit about his insane passive income portfolio. But now it really seems like he's found his purpose. He's crushing it and he's just enjoying life. You know, every time we do one of these episodes, your hope is that you'll at least have this one kind of strong nugget that everyone can take away. And for me in this episode, it was along that gardener theme. It was around how productive we are in life and how much we like use time to our advantage. And Because he uses this analogy of farming around acreage. And he says, you know, if you had 112 acres, would you only farm 40 of it? And we're, of course, like, no. And then... You know, he talks about how that is the same idea of like our productivity. We're only using 40 hours to better ourselves when maybe we have 112 hours at our disposal. Now, obviously, no one wants to physically work for 112 hours, but there's things that we can do in systems we can get in place where we can passively earn income in those other hours. And so that way we can use all 112 waking hours to our advantage. Now, it may not be us doing the work, maybe someone else. It may be you doing some more work, but there's so many more hours out there to take advantage of than just the 40 we generally think about. I also think it was important, something that he talked about was when he was on his FI journey, when he was toward the end steps of hitting financial independence, he said that people were working 500 hours a week on his goals. And obviously the math doesn't quite work out for John to be doing that by himself. But an important thing that he does is he outsources. He outsources the things that maybe other people are better than him at or things that he doesn't have time for. So I think that's a really important thing to leverage and something that took me a long time to hop on the outsourcing boat because I always just didn't want to pay the extra money or I thought I could do it better myself. But John just showed us how powerful this thing outsourcing is and how much faster it can help you hit this goal of financial independence. I also want to say that even though he does draw that analogy saying, yes, you do have 112 hours and you should be productive all the time. That doesn't mean you have to be grinding on whatever your career or your side hustles are. Like you could be working on yourself in a different way, like eating right, cooking good food, working out, meditating, whatever that thing is that makes you feel better, something that can you know help you or your money or your health or your mind, whatever that thing might be, that can still be grouped in into those 112 farming hours. And now it's time for the call to action. And the call to action this week is just exploring different passive income options. You know, this whole analogy of a farmer is all about putting in work up front and then reaping the rewards later. And that's the idea behind passive income. It's getting some kind of system set up and then having this steady flow of cash later where you can kind of enjoy life while your money makes money for you. Now, John did this with real estate. He has like $240,000 worth of passive income coming in. Obviously, no one's asking everyone to do something at that scale right away. Just find something small. Find something that you can put a little time effort, maybe even money into that will later then have some type of passive income stream for you. Because I think it's the first time you get that passive dollar coming in, it'll just really change your mindset and it'll get you ready to do more of it. And if you want to explore anything we talked about on the show today, dive into more written depth via our show notes. You can do that at thefyshow.com slash garden. That's thefyshow.com slash garden. 
And as always, if you want to check out our Facebook group page, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash community. And we always appreciate those five-star reviews. They help us get great guests like we had today. And if you're interested in supporting The Fi Show, you can do so by checking out some of our partners over at the resources page, which can be found at thefyshow.com slash resources. And thanks for listening.